The first uh, old timer to record his voice this afternoon is Bob Sainsbury. Where were you born, Mr. Sainsbury? I was born in Chatham, Ontario. When did you come to British Columbia? In 1898. 98? Yes. Uh, where were you located? I was located at New Westminster for the first five years. And I went from there to Kamloops, and I was there another six years in Kamloops. And then I went from there to Golden. And I went from Golden to Lethbridge, Alberta. And then I come back to Kamloops again. Well, when was it you come into the Kootenays? Oh, in 1922. 22. Yeah, I come to Nelson in 1922. Well, let's see. We worked together at the Emerald about uh, 23, didn't we? Yes, 24. Uh, yeah. 23 and 24. As a matter of fact, we worked up there till they put a whistle on it. <laughs> yes, sure. <you are. laughs> I come down with old Michonne. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when they closed it down that time, it just took 48 hours to clean the whole gang out of the camp and out of the country. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> there wasn't many there. How old are you now, Mr. Sainsbury? I'm 84. Only 84? That's all. Boy, you'll be an old-timer yet if you live long <laughs> enough. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, thanks a lot, Bob, for recording your voice. We'll have this on the tape here, and we'll play mm -hmm. it back after a while. You can hear how you sound. I Maybe was, you'll go to Hollywood. I was in the around the CPR there, you know, for five years. I fired out of Kamloops. Out oh, of Kamloops, yeah, yeah, I know you did. Yes. You remember when we used to wash boilers together? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Bob. All uh, right. On. The next voice we're going to record is that of Jimmy Spencer. Where were you born, Jimmy? I was born in Lee, Lancashire, England, 1896. 96. Did you bring the clogs and shawl with you when you came? I didn't bring the clogs and shawls, but I saw one of my sister's uh, a, uh, clogs here this spring, and she was only a year old at the time. But I didn't bring any clogs and shawls, me, no. no. We came, came here and all uh, my mother brought us out. She was a widow, and she brought out three boys and a daughter, and a, a little girl, rather. My oldest boy was 12, and I was 11 and uh, 10, rather, and the other fellow was 9, and the baby was about 2 years old. Did you come directly to British Columbia? We came right through Nelson here to Erie, and I remember quite well arriving in Nelson on one of the bo boats here, possibly in the Sooks and Coconee, and we landed on the old wharf and took a hack up, the, up to the uh, Grand Central Hotel. The uh, Ericsons were run at the time, I remember. Yes, Erickson. And we waited there till train time. The Great Northern left at night time. Then we went down to Erie. I was met at the station there by my uncle, Joe Campbell. Joe was one of the real old timers around here. Uh, I think he knew of the Emerald, the uh, the uh, Second Relief property, the Arlington property. Wouldn't even bother staking it because he was too busy digging gold out of the North Fork or trying to. <laughs> That's true. He was one of the old placer miners in this country. What year did you come to BC in? Well, it's November, I think, 22nd, 1907. 1907? Well, yeah. uh, that's... About 49 thing, years, yeah. First thing you know, you'll be revealing your age. Yeah. Well, ta 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 <laughs> Now, you were overseas in the First World War, Jimmy. Well, yes, I went over there in 1916. I had two and a half years in the line, as a matter of fact. Yeah, when I wanted to go over and look at the old country again, I guess, I don't know, something like that. Well, a lot of them done that, too. Well, you were over in the Second War, weren't you? Well, uh, I enlisted in the Second War with the Air Force. I thought I was going overseas again, but they wouldn't let me out of the country. Darn it. I had to stay in the country for four years. You didn't get back to Blighty, eh? No, I never got over there, no. Well, it. Jimmy, it's been a pleasure interviewing you and getting your voice on the tape here. And I know what you'll just... How, how about getting a son to uh, say a word or two? Has he got right a son you. here? I got my oldest boy right here. He the was born in Nelson. Oh, what do you want me to say? <laughs> you were born in Nelson. Yeah, I was born, born here and went through school here. How old are you now? I'm just 21 now. 21? Oh, you're, you're a young man. Oh, I'm married and got a family. Boy, you've got me beat. <laughs> 
he's uh, keeping up the tradition of the old timers. That's the idea. Aye. That's very, that's very, very nice. Well, it's awfully nice to have your. What is your first name? Lee. Lee. Uh. Lee Spencer. Well, thanks, Lee. It's awfully nice to have your voice on here. Thank and we you hope very much. In, oh, maybe another 50, 60 years, we'll be able to record it again for you. Uh, I hope. I hope you will too. <laughs> Now we're going to re record the voice of one of our real pioneers, one of the ladies, Mrs. Mc Mrs. McNish, formerly of Slocan City, now of Victoria, B.C. Where were you born, Mrs. McNish? I was born in Prairie Cumberland County, Nova Scotia. All the way back from the salt chuck on the other side? Yes. When did you come to British Columbia? I came in April of eight, uh, in June of 1896. Oh, well, you beat me here two years. Mm -hmm. You were, uh, your whole family was living in Slocan then, were they yes, not? Yes, the whole family came out at once, except my dad. He was out here ahead of us. I remember the most of the family. Mm -hmm. One time, you know, a matter of fact, when I first saw you, you were quite a young lady. A very Some time young, ago. A very young lady. <laughs> well, why bring that up? Uh, However, that's one oh, thing that we have no... Power over the passage no. of time. Oh no! Well, how do you like living in Victoria in preference to the Kootenays? Oh. Well, I'll always consider the Kootenays home. I lived here for 45 years before I went to Victoria, and I'll always think of the Kootenays as home. Although my home is there now, and I like Victoria very much, so it's a nice place to live in. There's beautiful scenery and there's beautiful drives and gardens and uh, very nice atmosphere. Well, the only regret I have, Mrs. McNish, is not being able to record the voice of your husband, Yeah, Tom. so I'd like to hear that, too. I would very, very much... Of course, we didn't have this idea while no. Tom was still with us. No. But I know it would be right down his alley. Yeah. And he would enjoy it very, very much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Mrs. McNish, for recording your oh, voice for us. Well. And I hope he you enjoy some... your afternoon very oh, much. Oh, I sure I will. The next voice we're going to record is that of Mr. Lomax, commonly known to the old timers as Lomi. His first name is Cuthbert, but don't hold it against him. Yeah, where, were you uh, where were you born, Mr. Lomax? Uh, uh, in the Bolton. Bolton, in Bolton, Lancashire. Bolton, in Lancashire. Yeah. Uh, when did you come to Canada? Well, 1910. 1910. Yeah. You come directly to the Kootenays? Yeah. And you've. Uh, and let me tell you something, Nelson was a damn sight better town than it is now. I agree with you. You'll get no <laughs> argument out of me on that. But uh, <laughs> there's always a chance for it to improve. Yeah. Well, outside of your service in the Army, Mr. Lomax, you lived in the Kootenays all that time. All right. Pardon? All that time, yeah. Well, thank you very, very much for recording your yeah. voice for yeah, us. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. Should do. <laughs> I like you. meeting you too. Pardon? I like meeting you oh, too. Oh, definitely. We can yeah. always tell the odd yarn. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. Okay, Ron. Now tell him a good one. No, no, I won't tell him now. <laughs> the next voice we're going to record is uh, that of John Applewaite. Uh, John, you're a native son, are you not? That's right. I was born in the old Kootenay Lake General Hospital, the old frame building that afterwards was torn down. I suppose that's the reason why they tore it down. <laughs> well, that's as good an excuse as any. Uh, you have made this part of the country your home. Very definitely. I was raised behind a stump up at Willow Point, and we lived in a log cabin there for about 14 years. I went to school out at Willow Point and here in Nelson. I can remember Mr. Smiley, Mr. L. V. Rogers, Many of the old-time school teachers, and I still think that the old Nelson High School will always be a seat of learning, no matter whether it's youngsters or oldsters. I would like to just put in that plug for the old Nelson High School. Well, that's very nice of you, John, and I'll see that this is played back so that some of the staff up there will get an earful on it. I know they'll appreciate that. They, they put me in mind of the compensation board. One of them told me, he says, you know, we stop an awful lot of brickbats, but very few bouquets. However, I agree with you on the... Uh, you on better the bring, bring Teddy into this. Uh, I was just too. going to say, you have a, a brother that went to school here. 
Yes, E.T. Applewhite, known as Teddy. He was a lawyer in Rosslyn, and then he went up north, and at the present time, he's member of parliament for Skeena. That's the Prince Rupert district, and is also deputy speaker of the House of Commons. But uh, there's a far greater reason for him being thought of, and that is that he was the first child christened in St. Saviour's Pro Cathedral. And I think he's prouder of that than the fact that occasionally he dismisses the House of Commons. <laughs> Well, for his benefit, I went to Sunday school in the old Anglican church before the Pro Cathedral was built or even thought of under the Reverend Henry Akerst. As a matter of fact, it was Akerst who, cri who christened my <laughs> brother, and the windows weren't in at that time, so that I don't know which of you got there first. However, it's a good thing to know that both of you went to church at least once. Well, I did at least twice. <laughs> I'll not tell you how I got chucked out of it. That's another story entirely. Well, thanks, John, for recording your voice for us. We appreciate that very, very much. Okay, we'll do what we can to help the old-timers. Thank you. And now we're going to record the voice of another one of our pioneers, Mrs. Tom Rickson. George. Uh, Bill Rickson. Oh, Mr. Mr. Bill Rickson. I, yes. I beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway... Uh, where were you born, Mrs. Rickson? In um, Ontario. Middlesex, Ontario. Pardon? Middlesex, Ontario. Yes. Uh, when did you come to British Columbia? 1913. 1913? Yes. You have made your home here ever since. Yes. Uh, your husband used to follow... Uh, Gardening and uh, carpenter work. Carpenter work. Well, yes. when I knew him, he was uh, very much interested in the gardening end of it. Oh yes, he did a little of both. How old was Mr. Rickson? He was 95 when he passed. On. 95. Yes. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. I know just a short time before that he received a 60-year jewel from the Oddfellows, yes. did he not? Yes. Well, there are very few of them in the country. 60-year jewels and almost anything. He was the oldest one in the Odd Palace. Oh, yes. The oldest in British Columbia, I know. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much, Mrs. Rickson, for recording your voice. We appreciate that very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next voice we're going to record is that of Bill Ridge. Where do you live, Bill? Bonington. Bonington, that's what BC. I <laughs> Down by the Big Falls. Aye, right. Where were you born, Mr. Ridge? I was born in 80, 1982. Where? At uh, Pontypool, Ontario. Now, when did you come to British Columbia? I come to British Columbia in 1904. 1904. Uh, what were you following? What line of... Uh, I was in uh, mining, logging, road building, and any old work I could get a hold of. You've done something similar to what I've done myself. Yeah. Well, you have farmed out there, have you not? At, uh, yes. Bonington? Yes. I, I cleared property for the uh, Okanagan Commercial Orchard Company for one for two years, and uh, then I decided it's Kootenay. Well, that's a good outfit to work for. So I worked for the West Kootenay for 37 years. Well, that's quite a long sentence. In the meantime, meantime, I bought my own place. And I've been living on it for uh, 26 years. Well, that speaks well for the place and for your determination to stay in the country. So, uh, I'm retired now, living on my own place. So I think that's where I'll reside. Well, you couldn't pick a nicer spot, Mr. Ridge, if you look from one end of the country to the other. Thank you very much for recording your voice for us. Uh, but um, I didn't the figure okay. I was saying too much. The next voice we're going to record is that of Mr. Robert Bayles of Crawford Bay. Mr. Bayles, when did you come to uh, Canada? I came to Canada in 1904. 1904. Where were you born? Born in uh, South Wales. In South Wales? Great Britain. Uh, you have resided in the Kootenays practically all the time, have you not? Well, uh, yes, practically all the time, except for six months that I went over to the old country and visit. Well, uh, you had a brother 
one time living at the bay. He's passed on now. What was his name? Will. Will Bayless. He was quite a famous painter, was he not? Well, he was, I would say, a very good amateur painter. I have seen some of his work, mostly his wood carving. I uh, met him several times going back and forth when I was working on the ferry here. I was introduced to him by Mr. Clarihue. Uh, has he, a, he has a painting somewhere on the coast, has he not? Yes, in the, um, in the art gallery that's uh, attached to the uh, public li library in Vancouver. In Vancouver. That's the Carnegie Library. Yes. Well, thank you very, very much, Mr. Bayliss, for recording your voice for us. We appreciate that very much. The next voice we're about to record is that of M.C. Donaldson of Salmo. Caddy is one of the first presidents of the Old Timers Association. At the present time, is one of our honored vice presidents. Where were you born, Mr. Donaldson? Nuri Island. Where? Nuri Island. That's got me beat. Count it down, then. <laughs> well, come on again. I, my grandmother was born in County Down. Well, that's yeah. Nuri's at the southern end of it, on yeah. the border between the Irish Free State, what's now the Irish Free State, and Ulster. Now, you were what they call the Black North. Yeah, the Black North is right. <laughs> when did you come to Canada, Mr. Donaldson? 1888. 88? To I'm Victoria. Two, that's two years after I was born. That's getting <laughs> right. Sometime. When did you come to Kootenays? 1896. 96. Well, you beat me two years in there, too. I came in 98. <laughs> You've made your home mostly in the Salmon Valley, haven't you? Yes. You uh, at one time worked for the Canadian Pacific as a dispatcher, did you not? Not as a dispatcher, but I worked as an operator. An operator. Right. And I had two or three brothers in that business myself. As far as I ever got one was carrying telegrams. <laughs> uh, are you retired now, Mr. Donald? Supposed to be, but... Uh, you work harder than ever. Working harder than ever is right for <laughs> us. Well, I, I understand you, the... Uh, Pu Ba out in Salmo now. You're the village no. clerk. Village clerk is well, right. Well, he's Pu Ba in any community. <laughs> well, they couldn't get anybody else to take it, so that's why they put me that's in there. Is the wife down here today? I'm sorry, uh, Ross, but I lost a wife last November. Oh, is that so? November. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, where are your children now, Daddy? The youngest daughter's in Salmo. Lives just across the back alley from me. My boy is in Toronto, That's and Bill. Bill, and my oldest girl, Peggy, she's in Ottawa. In Ottawa. I've got six grandchildren. Well, you got me beat. I've only got three. <laughs> well, I, I've, you've got to go some. I've got ten. Oh, well. <laughs> well, we'll take our hats off. Here. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks very much for recording your voice for us, Mr. Donaldson. You must remember that you're speaking for posterity because... These tapes are going to be treasured and cherished by the old timers for time immemorial. At least we hope so. Uh, what are you going to do? Put them in the pharaohs, or? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> put them in their archives. The only thing. Uh, flame, uh, flame every once in a while. Uh, yeah. There's only one stipulation about it: that the police don't have access to them. Well, that's. So you can say almost you can say anything Mike you want, then. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ruth. Later on in the afternoon, Mr. Donaldson, I'd like to call on you for a little speech. Will that be okay by you? Oh, I guess so. I don't know what I'd talk about, anything more than old-timers. So. Well, that's fine. That's what we want. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Caddy. Yeah. The next voice we're going to record is that of one of our old-timers, Mr. Aubrey Phillips. Where were you born, Mr. Phillips? I was born in uh, Cornwall, England. Your cousin Jack. Right. <laughs> when did you come to Canada? I came to Nelson in September 1905. 1905. Well, that's... Quite an early date. On the old Moye. I was on the Moye the day it was launched in 98. Oh, yeah. Uh, your whole Same family, here. <laughs> your whole family, yes. Your whole family resided in Nelson. That's for right. Quite a period of time, didn't you? Yes. Uh, where do you make your home now? My home is in trail now. Well, I was in trail last week, and it got up to 108 there one afternoon. I yeah. thought that was pretty warm. Yeah, still it's pretty warm over there. While I lived in trail myself, the, that was during the first war. The highest I ever saw was 103. Yeah. 
Well, thanks very much, Mr. Phillips, You're for quite recording welcome. your voice for us. You're quite welcome. Thank you. The next voice we're going to record is that of Joe Riley, another one of our old timers. Where were you born, Joe? Grenfell, Saskatchewan. Out in the wide open spaces, yes. where the men are men and the women are glad of it. When did you come to Nelson? 1899. That uh, jibes right along with my own recollection. I remember when the Riley family came here. We all used to go to school together. Yeah, I remember yeah. Bill and yeah. all the rest up to Central School. I worked with Bill and Trail for a couple of years during the First World War. The last time I had any connection with him, I don't believe I ever saw him since then. So he went down south, didn't he? No, yeah, he was killed in Portland. He was killed in oh, Portland, yeah. Oregon. I remember that quite yeah. well. Uh, yeah. Where are you making your home now? Uh, trail, B.C. Still in Trail. You can't yeah. divorce you from that place at all. No. Well, you've uh, practically worked for the CMS there outside of war service most of your life, have you not? No, 21 years with the city of Nelson. Oh, that's right, that's right. You were down the power plant there yes. for so long we forgot you. <laughs> well, well, we're, gonna... we're mixing you up with your brother. Uh, Charlie? Charlie. Yeah. yeah. That's it. He was a safety officer or something like that. On the traffic, wasn't he? Wasn't he in that traffic office? Uh, that's traffic? me. Oh, that's oh, you. That's him. Oh, that is you. Yeah. I get the oh, two fellas mixed up. Well, thanks, Joe, for, or, uh, Mr. Riley, for recording your voice for us. We appreciate it very, very much. You'll be able to come back here all 40, 50 years from now and hear this record played over in your... See how young you sound yes. then, eh? <laughs> we hope a little bit. Okay. So, thanks, Joe. The next voice we're going to record is that of Bill Bennett. Uh, where were you born, Mr. Bennett? In London, England. London, England. You come yep. here quite a ways from your barracks right now. Oh, and you? how? Uh, I'm not going to ask you how old you are. When did you come to British Columbia? In the winter 1906. 1906. Well, you've lived in and around the Kootenays virtually all that time, haven't oh, you? Oh, yes. Right, yes, right. Uh, who were you employed by in Nelson? Burns Company. The old P. Burns Company. Yeah, the old P. Burns. Well, you're retired and making your home in Trail now, yeah, are you not? I've been there since 47. Mm -hmm. And how you stand it, I don't know. I hope none of the Trail people are listening. <laughs> <laughs> I put in four years in Trail myself. Yeah? I was there last week when it was 108 Ooh. last Thursday. That's Pretty hot. The, that's quite warm. Yeah. However, trail is growing marvelously since I first saw it. Uh, you purpose making your home there? Well, I don't know. For a while, anyway. Uh -huh. I'd love to come back to Nelson. Well, now... That's, Wife would, too. That's the first smart thing you said for a long time. Come on back. We'd be glad to have you, Bill. <laughs> and thanks very much for recording your voice for us, Mr. Bennett. You'll be able to come back here another 40, 50 years and well, hear this played over so. again. I'm going to make it 100 or bust. Well, all right. I'll, I'll go right along with you on that. Thanks a lot, Bill. Okay, Ross. The next voice we're going to record is that of Mr. Percy Morey. Where were you born, Mr. Morey? In 1882, in London, England. You're the second Londoner here in a row. Copy? No. You're not, you're, you're no, 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 no. I did late on in life, but oh. not when... Not that I was born. <laughs> not within, not within Bovell, eh? Absolutely. When did you come to Canada, Mr. Morgan? 1905, and right. I went to the old Wyman mine, out at Wyman. My well, brother-in-law, H.C. Nichols, was in charge. That was for the London and B.C. gold, gold fields, was it not? Well, it was, yes, yeah. yeah. Those are the people that built the building well, <laughs> that's at present <laughs> occupied by the Nelson Daily News. That's right. Sure. S.S. Fowler was their first agent general sure, here. Sure, that's right. The man that uh, founded the big mine at Ryandell. Yeah. The old Bluebell. Mm -hmm. uh, you have been in the Kootenays virtually all, all the time. Since then, sure. Have you not? Yeah. You make your home here all the time. Sure, yes. Well, what line of uh, endeavor did you follow? Accounting. Accounting. Time, sure. Well, now that doesn't jive. A man from London, the man who does the accounting in this country is generally from the land of the cakes, the Scotchman. He uh, introduced the bagpipes and double entry bookkeeping and Scotch whiskey all over the world, didn't he? Chiefly Scotch whiskey, yes. Sure. Well, they've they done a good job of it. Absolutely. Hey. Yeah.
Well, have you anything interesting you could tell us about your no, experiences in BC? Nothing at all, no. You're like me, you've led a very quiet life. Absolutely. <laughs> Ra raised a family. Even the, you might call them respectable. Absolutely, oh, yes, sir. Definitely. Well, I've been associated with Rossing one or two of the musical little oh, things yes, which we put on. Sure. I can remember being in on different deals where you played piano myself. Sure. Pies. Young as I am. You know, oh, I still well, remember yeah. these old things. W wonderful memories. Percy. Absolutely, <laughs> sure they were. Well, Lots thanks. of good fun. Thanks very, very much You're for recording your voice for us, Mr. Murray. Well, I hope it won't hurt anybody's feelings when they all jar their nerves when they hear it. <laughs> when you you can come back in about another 40, 50 years and we'll play it back for you. Oh, yeah. well, well, Ross at the controls, too. Oh, yes, it's Ross will be there. there. Up in the pearly gates. What the, next, the next voice we're about to record is that of Roy Hunter, one of our real old timers and a retired railroad engineer. Where were you born, Mr. Hunter? I was born in Hamilton, Ontario, in 1884. You got me beat two years. When did you come to BC? 1888. 88. You still got me beat. Ten years. Uh, where did you uh, make your home? Uh, Vancouver. North Bend, Lytton, uh, Ashcroft, uh, short time at Clinton. You weren't a traveling salesman, were you? Not at that age. Oh, not at that age. No. He was gradually Pre working Prince his way into the garden spot of the Kootenays, and he finally Prin got Prin here. Principally back at Yale. Well, you've followed Around. railroading virtually all your life, have you not? That's right. Uh, you were on the... Uh, Brotherhood of Engineers Standing Grievance Committee, were you not? For I was here for 15 years. Well, you spent a great deal of that time in the United States, did you not? Eight years. Where? Out of Cleveland, covering all of the United States and all of Eastern Canada. Well, you had a more or less of a variegated experience in labor disputes then? Very much so. What do you think of the present United States steel strike? The presence of the United States steel strike is, in my opinion, fostered by the heavy interest to raise the price of steel. I believe you're right, Roy. The same as the John L. Lewis crowd and the coal strike in the United States. The big operators got all the money and the miners got a little. Not well, very now, much. Well, folks, you're getting it right from the box, though, because Roy knows what he's talking about. Roy, Roy, the, the uh, train is making Roy feel right at home here. Uh, I never home. I never even hear it anymore. <laughs> no, they, no. That, that was a whistle just there. <laughs> well, tell me something, Roy. What do you think of these diesels? Well, they uh, an improved uh, tin lizzy. Uh, you're sitting up on the nose with uh, very little protection. And uh, whether they'll accomplish what they uh, figure they do, they will in uh, economy, uh, remains to be seen. The uh, classification of men and the what is entailed in the knowledge that they must possess to be a successful uh, operator, an engineer, or anyone in the employ of the, tra of the running trades, whether that is going to be an improvement by taking the responsibility away from them, I don't think so. It uh, doesn't lend itself to the ideas of uh, craftsmanship in the handling of trains because the new innovations has taken that and removed that. It remains to be seen whether they're going to be as successful uh, as what they anticipate. Well, Roy, I'm inclined to think that you're right. And I agree with you on it. I, I still like the sound of the old steam engines myself. Oh, it has a it has a charm to it that uh, is now long gone. Romantic appeal, isn't it? That's right. The uh, opportunities and the uh, look at the hot one there on fire. See it way at the head end of the train. There's a train going by here now, folks, with a hot box on one of the cars, and uh, Mr. Hunter, of course, with his eagle eyes, spotted it. And uh, it wouldn't go very far burning like that before the journal cut off. Well, the boys in the yard can tend to that one. <laughs> yes. I saw one going by the other day, uh, just the same, just blazing up like everything. You know that uh, 
the amount of traffic and the amount of tonnage that has moved today it's like everything else the ever-changing trend of events in uh, uh, in our world of uh, advancement today is bringing about uh, a new area in the transportation uh, movement of uh, heavy commodities along our the rails of our great country what a great many people are fooling themselves on is that uh, they have now changed the uh, method of transportation and have confined their operation to the movement of uh, merchandise over the highways at which the, at the taxpayers expense that's another point on which <laughs> i agree with you well thanks for recording your voice for mr hunter Okay. And I'm inviting you now to come back a whole 50 years from now and hear a playback on this. Uh, 50 years yeah, from just now. 50. Okay. Is the wife we'll back here? Yeah, she's around here. Well, I'll tell her to come down. We want her. You yes, might, we may have here. trouble, but uh, we would like to have her. <laughs> The next voice we're going to record is that of Mrs. Tony Robinson. Oh. Where, where were you born, Mrs. Robinson? In Kirkfield, Ontario. Kirkfield, Ontario. Yes. Uh, when did you come to British Columbia? In uh, 1905. 1905. Uh, have you lived in here ever since then? Uh, we lived out at Blewett. At Blewett. Well, you've been in the Kootenays. Yes. You've been in the Kootenays. I was on the farm. Well, you were farming all the time, were you? Until we retired and uh -huh. something else. Uh, is your husband with you? Yes. Mm -hmm. He's right at the back there. Oh, I sure he is. I, I didn't look around. No. Come here. <laughs> well, you've been uh, how long in the Kootenays? We've been, uh, let me see, we've been 50 years. 50, 50 years? 50, I've got you 51 beat a years. Bit. 51 years. I've got you beat a little bit. You I came have. in 98. Oh, well, I came in 1905. <laughs> and uh, came from Alberta. Yes. Well, we, moved in, we moved in here from Alberta, too. Well, we, we were near High River. In, uh, we, lived, uh, we lived on the main line up above Calgary, Kananaska. Well, you see, we were south of Calgary. Oh, yeah. I see. All right. Well, will you sign yeah. it? Down around Cochrane, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, they knew Bob, you know. They used to, they used to punch cattle down around Cochrane. They used to punch cattle down around Cochrane. Down as far as Gleason. Yes, they were in trail in 94. Bill drove a stagecoach between Trail and Ross in 94, before the Niagara Gage was built. Yes, I did. Well, thanks, like Mrs. Robinson, for recording your voice for us. Well, thank you. You come back about 50 years from now, and we'll play this over for you again. All right, then, that'll be just fine. Where will you be, and where will I be? <laughs> oh, we'll be right here. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Years from now. <laughs> Me to say. Uh, we're now going to record the voice of Mrs. Regis McPhail, Mrs. Jack McPhail, am I right? Yes. yes. Where were you born, Mrs. McPhail? I was born in Inverness, Scotland. Inverness? Mm-hmm. That's quite, you're quite a long ways from the barracks. When did you come to Canada? Uh, I, um, Your dad? Aren't you I'm not sure. I was about five years old. Well, when did you come to British Columbia? 1900. 1900. Oh, that, that really qualifies you as an old timer. <laughs> you, uh, made, you've made your home in Nelson ever since, have you not? Yes, yes. Nelson. Raised your family here? Right. All born here. All born here and all raised here. Well, I've watched most of them grow up myself. Yes. Some of them were, well, I couldn't say they were contemporaries. They were all younger than I am. Well, John used to do a good job for us in the city of Nelson. Yes, John was a John he was, was a great a very, superintendent. He yes. was a very faithful servant for the town for a long, yeah. long, long time. Yeah. Very well. We're now going to record the voice of I.G. Nelson, one of our real old timers. Uh, where were you born, Mr. Nelson? In Northwood, Iowa. Northwood, Iowa. 1874. Well, that qualifies you as an old timer, any place. Uh, when did you come to British Columbia? In December 98. December 98. Well, I, I beat you here about nine, ten months. 
I came in January. Mm -hmm. uh, you were associated with uh, the late Lou Larson at that time, were you not? Yes, we were partners and cousins. Well, I know now that's a new one on me all the years I've known you. I never knew you were cousins. I we didn't either. <laughs> used to have quite a crew. By the way, one of your old-time hands is still, I believe he's living in Hamilton, Ontario. Do you know who I mean? Fred Bell? Well, I know him. Yeah. Well, he used to work with you there. Yes, Fred Bell. Uh, Roy Sharp met him in Hamilton about uh, four years ago, five years ago. Yes. Looked him up when he was back there. Still going strong. Mm -hmm. Fred uh, Bell, eh? You, uh, after you left the old original old curiosity shop wasn't it on josephine street yes mr larson had that when i came to that's Nelson. right and on the corner of the building was maggie duffy's bon ton cafe that's right right across the alley from doc boyd's manhattan saloon that's right am i correct that's right well so much for that i i see uh, you might uh, be interested in to know that i still have the old business desk that I bought out, made out of the old curiosity shop. Is that so? Uh, I don't know about, I don't know just when it was, but uh, the last year that you were in there, I guess. Well, I didn't work very much in the curiosity shop. I was with uh, D. MacArthur and Company. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. On, on the on corner. The cor on corner ward. That's right. That's right. You and uh, Louis afterwards took over MacArthur's business, didn't That's you? That's right. You bought them out, and then you moved down a couple of years following that, you moved down to Lang Stocks building, where the present Sterling Furniture is. That's right. Standard and standard furniture. Yeah. Yeah. You had one of my old bosses there, Fred Irvin. Yes. I used to work for the Fred Irvin Company. That's right. <laughs> well, you followed the furniture business right up until your retirement, Well, you? I, uh, I was in business about 38 years. In Nelson and retired in '35. But you uh, September '35. You we followed. bought our wedding furniture from your oh, I remember. your store. Yeah. <laughs> you have followed the mining industry quite a bit, though. Quite right a lot. Quite yeah. interested in that. Yeah. You're still interested oh. in it. Oh, in a way. Well, there's nothing keeps you young like keeping employed in something like that. That's, that's right. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Nelson, for recording your voice for us. And as I have suggested to several of the youngsters here, you come back in about 50 years and we'll play this tape recording over for you. You hear what your <laughs> voice sounded like when you were a kid. Well, uh, I'll call you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so long, uh, I.G. But uh, I was born awfully young, you know. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're getting younger every year. Run me, Okay. Uh, we're now going to record the voice of Mrs. George Renwick. Uh, where were you born, Mrs. Renwick? In Ontario. Uh, in Ontario. Well, you know, it's a peculiar Get thing that about 90% of the people oh, that registered from. here Is that either right? came, they came from Ontario or the Maritimes. Uh -huh. uh, when did you come to British Columbia? In 1920. 1920. Well, there's been a lot of water go down the river in Since between then. the time you came and yeah. the time uh, I came. Yeah. However, I was uh, I was working out the Sheep Creek country at the time when your family came. Yes. I came in here in '26. I got to know the whole family very well. Mm. They were all in the trucking business. Yes. I used to buy fuel from them yeah. and so on. Yes, I guess you did. The whole family have made their home in and around here yes, ever since. Yes. 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 How many of the family are living in Nelson now? Uh, there's, uh, three. Bring them right around. Uh, Lloyd and uh, Hager and Ross. No, and uh, Archie. Yeah. That's all. Working. Just the three of them? Yeah. Well, where is Ross? He's in uh, Vancouver. He's in the hospital right at present. Oh, he is? Yes. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry to hear been that. been there a year. Around, and your daughters? Uh, they're married. One is married to um, in Vancouver to Mr. Smith. Yes, I remember. Him. And the other one's married to um, Earl Reed. Yes, I remember. Him. And the other one is married to uh, uh, in in uh, Saskatchewan. 
and the other one died. Your family is like ours, and yeah. they're scattered and people tend out. Yes. Although yes, there's more Renwicks now than there are of our tribe. Yeah, I the suppose they are. They're, they soon increase. The mechanics are getting cut down. <laughs> Time, you know, yeah. cleans up on all of us. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, yes. Mrs. Well, Renwick, for recording your voice for us. That's fine. And I hope we'll come back in another yes, 10 or 20 sure. 30 years and we'll play the silver boy. I hope so. Thank you. Mrs. Martin here wants. I'll get Mrs. Martin, yeah. We're now going to record the voice of one of our real old timers and one of our first police officers, Jim Fowles. Where were you born, Jim? Hey? Where were you born? Gray County, Ontario. Gray County? Yeah. When did you come to British Columbia? When did you come? 88. 1888. Did you come directly to the Kootenays? No, I I come on the main line of the CPI, I got a first dollar. Uh-huh. I put in the wind around there, one big and tight, one thing and another. Then in the spring I went up to the Okanagan. Uh huh. I worked on the Burning Ranch. Yes, yeah, the cold stream. Yeah, I worked on the Burning Ranch for Ned Woods. Uh, uh, when, when were you on the police force in Nelson? Huh? When were you on the police force in Nelson? 1891. 1891. Who was the chief of police then? Huh? Who was the police chief then? Or was there a chief? There was no chief. There was no chief. No. You, you were a chief. You were, a... you were the whole force, were you? I was the whole chief. Oh, you were... <laughs> <laughs> well, you were ahead of Ketchum. Huh? You were ahead of Seneca Ketchum. He well, was the first chief appointed by John Houston in 97. There was a fellow there, Nelson, his name was Charlie McMillan. Yeah. And Charlie says... Uh, he was a big husky guy, about 245, and he was grabbing a hold of several of us there and finding it on. And by Georgie, he said, I want to shake you fellas up a little bit. I said, well, talk to God, you'll get shaken up yourself. <laughs> <laughs> by Georgie, he picked me out. He said, Jim, they want a policeman here. Now he said, I think you will. Fill the bill. Well, I had no ghost of being a policeman, though, but I was waiting for George and brother to come in. I said, bye, George. I thought to myself, I could take that, and when he comes in, I'll quit. <laughs> and I took the job. I was here all summer, and he never showed up. Oh, well, I stayed all summer. Yeah. I went up... Uh, I went over to Hall Creek. Oh, you know, after I uh, quit the police post, I got up. I don't know, you know. I went over to Hall Creek and I passed a mine over there. Yeah. And then I shut out. Well, this was 1892. Um, well, you, and, you and your brother made quite a name for yourself uh, in the old uh, days of, uh, of rock drilling. Oh, we used to, George and I, we drilled rock we go all over the country. You yeah. worked uh, You worked a long time in the Boundary, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Over on uh, Phoenix, Phoenix, Greenwood, Greenwood. Yeah. Mother Lowe. Then you you uh, come to Nelson for the drilling contest. Yeah, I, yeah. I seen you drilling down. Yeah. Hello there. I seen you. How are you? I seen you yeah. drilling down alongside the Queen's Hotel there years ago. Yeah. Down well, with the present Eagle Hall well, there. I remember, I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Well, did you go back to the Boundary Country then, after you left here? Yes, I went back. And then uh, next time I bumped into you was when we were working together on the Ponderay on the Reeves McDonald's, 1926. Yeah, I, I was over there on the Ponderay. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, I had a... Oh, about 10 or 12 years ago, about 10 years ago, more. I built a place up in Cottonwood. Yeah, yes, I, I remember that. I thought, by George, I'll have a home mill. Yeah. So I built a place up there, and... and I had a pretty good place, you know, I had a garden, and everything, you know, and I, I had the privilege of buying the ground, yeah. and by George, when he come to the right part of it, 
seen that, but I couldn't have done it. The government took it for highway. Uh huh, yeah. But I sold it to yeah. I sold this to a fellow. Yeah, give it up for the. And he bought it for Mrs. Mary Wilson. Yeah. He, he, and he gave me. He gave me $800 for the place. Right, right, whole damn thing was right there. And all is all fenced in, you know. And nice chicken house. And uh, everything was just fine. But by George, I went uh, off for a while. And he, uh, he tried to buy the, the ground. The government wouldn't sell it to him. Yeah. So I gave him some of the money back. When they got in the water, they turned And uh, it was told to me, you know, I could, I could, I could take the property if I wanted, but if I had got it, they'd have taken it from me, you know. Oh, sure. sure. Where, are you living, where are you living now, uh, Jim? Yeah. Where are you living now? I'm at the Mount St. Francis. As if I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> I see you every couple of weeks. Uh, well, Jim, have you still got that fancy high-powered rifle you had on the pond ray? Yeah, you no, that, no, that, that I target sold rifle? It. I sold it. I had, uh -huh. a, I had a target rifle and I had that. But I sold my I had no use for him. I, too, too late to go out to hunt. Do you remember that fancy 35 caliber revolver you had? That officer's revolver? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. They promised to give me that a long time oh, ago. Oh, thank George. They were, <laughs> they were good. They were good. By the way, folks, Jim was one of our real crack rifle shots in the early days in this but country. You, know, you didn't want to get in front of him at all if he had anything in his, I went in his hand the way he was shooting iron. I went up to Kansas City one time with a rifle shoot, yeah. turkey shoot. Jim. Yeah. I went up there and I got five turkeys. Sure. And they used to have a bunch of good shots up there, too. By George, there was one turkey, 18-pound turkey. And the fellow says to me, Jim, he says, 18-pound turkey. He says, I want to see you get that one. But we had a, we had a lay on the ground. Yeah, yeah. 200 yards. And uh, our target was about as big around as that. Yeah. Six agents. I pretty near sent with the target. <laughs> Some fellow was down telling the target I was going to hoot with now. He hollered down. He said, over me that shot has got the eighteen pound turkey. <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for recording your voice for us, Jim. We appreciate it very, very much. And we hope that you'll be back here next year and the year after and uh, a good many years after that to hear this record played over again. Yeah, well you know by George. I was down here several years ago and picnic. Yeah. We're now going to record the voice of Archie Robinson. Uh, where were you born, Archie? In Nelson. In Nelson. How long ago? 1901. 1901. Well, that's, that's right. Uh, that qualifies you all right. Where do you make your home at the present time? Qualicum Beach, Vancouver Island. Well, let me ask you something personal. Do you get web-footed living down there near the salt chuck? Oh, no, nothing yeah, oh, like that. Well, I always no. thought you did. <laughs> uh, your parents still live here. Mother's still here, yes. yes. I recorded her voice here a few minutes ago. Did you? Yeah. Got Kirby's book here. Is well, listen, uh, get Kirby over There's here. There's another one. <laughs> Sorry for the interruption, folks. There's people rushing up here trying to spend their money with us. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing at the present time? Teaching Rob? school. Teaching school. Teaching school quality. Oh, you were what they were, you would qualify as a musketry instructor. Oh, why a musketry instructor? They're teaching the young idea how to shoot. Oh, I see. That is it. Eh? Well, that's, that's an old <laughs> gag. The present generation of school teachers are not familiar with it. I've sprung that on a lot of them. Yeah, you sure have. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> well, uh... You're just up here on holiday. Just on a holiday for a couple of weeks. Well, I've got to pay tribute to your judgment. You always come up to the garden spot at the Kootenays to spend your holidays. That's right. That that's shows right. a great deal of discretion, I'll say, on your part. Oh, yes, that's right. And, of right. course, it's nice to get back to the old 
Old haunting grounds, old, eh? No, not haunting. Just yeah. old stamping grounds. Yeah, stamping grounds. Okay. The old time <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Robinson, okay. for recording your voice, and I will extend to you the same invitation you've given to all the others. Come back in 50 years, and we'll play this record over for you, and you'll hear what your voice sounds like. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Right. Robinson. Now, folks, we're going to record really something. We have with us uh, Mr. Robert Maine, commonly known as Bob Maine. Bob had a poem in the Daily News, I believe, the day before yesterday, and he has kindly consented to read it to us to make a recording of it. We will play it back for the benefit of the assembly over the loudspeaker later on in the evening. Go ahead, Mr. Maine. From a shack on the shores of the Kootenay sprang a city of charm and beauty. The magic wands of the pioneers guided them in their loyal duty. And now the city of Nelson stands the reward of careful planning. Brain, brawn and muscle all combined, the sweat from their faces fanning. Today in this lovely lakeside park, the pioneers all will gather to talk with pleasure of work well done, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, telling the tales of a glorious past when they were young and carefree, perhaps building a shack by the side of a creek or swinging an axe into some tree. Sailing away up the mountainside, wealth under their feet maybe, or resting by a splashing creek and brewing a pot of tea. Those were the days they will never forget, of the pals they met on the way, with a happy smile or a helping hand to cheer them on many a day. Oh, happy day! Let joy prevail. Nelson thanks you and blesses you. May the years to come see you live again. Canadians both loyal and true. Thanks very much, Bob. Thanks very much for this and on your other many contributions. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, later on in the day, I'd, li I'd like to tell us... Uh, Oh, no, this is not on the leg. Uh, later on the day, I'd like to tell a story. You know, uh, about the old time. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Maine. <laughs> We're now going to record the voice of John Henry Long. Uh, where were you born, John? Where were I born? Niagara on the Lake. Niagara on the Lake, the home of the Bishop family. Absolutely. Uh, when did you come to British Columbia, Jack? March, uh, February 1910. February 1910. Uh, you came here in the employ of the CPR? I did. And you worked with them consecutively? 35 years. 35, that's a short span. It's an awful long one when you put it in one place, isn't it? Oh, man. Well, uh, you've been retired how long? 12 years. 12 years? Gee, where's time you does fly? I didn't think it was that long. long. Time flies, especially you? as you get older. You've been uh, <laughs> you've been uh, very deeply interested in curling. Oh yes, I've been curling since 1917. Uh, you used to be quite a ball shark in the early days yes, too. I was a you used to play a little hockey at one time. I used time. to be a hockey player. Played with the Bishops back east. Yeah. As a matter of fact, John's kind of an all-around athlete. He does a little bit of everything. I can, I can remember years ago, this is telling tales out of school, John used to keep book for us on a snooker game on Sundays. The game would be so big we needed to have a bookkeeper. Do you remember that? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you still uh, are secretary of the curling club, are oh, you? Oh, yes. Huh? Yes, yeah, been three years. Two years? Four years. Four uh, years? No, oh, not four years. What four years? Four years I've been... Oh, four years. Yeah, I beg I'm, your pardon. Four years I've been secretary. <laughs> well... We hope that you'll stay with us, John, and be with us and act in that capacity for 
another 20 or 30 years oh, anyway. Well, that, uh, and then we'll let you retire from that. I suspect a little too much, but I hope to do it for quite a while yet. Well, <laughs> thanks, Jack, for recording your voice for us, and uh, I'll extend to you the same invitation I've given to all the young folks. Come back in about 50 years and we'll play this record over for you. Thank you a lot. You'll hear what your voice sounded like when you were a kid. I'll try to be here. <laughs> All right, Goodbye. Jack. Thanks a lot. The next voice we're going to record is that of uh, Charlie Pearson, Charles Dean Pearson, the business manager of the Daily News. I think everybody in Nelson knows Charlie. Charlie, where were you born? I was born in uh, the Walthamstow, England. Uh, when did you come to Canada? I came to Canada in 1904. 1904? In uh, Kirkton, Ontario. Uh, when did you come to British Columbia? I came to uh, British Columbia into Grand Forks in 1907, February 1907. Uh-huh. Well, uh, what were you doing at that time? Well, I wasn't... I was rushing into the smelter at first, and then later, they learned that I was a kind of a two-third of a printer, and one of the printers absconded to the American side, so they asked me to go to work. And I've been a printer ever since. Uh, you finished out your time then on the famous Grand Forks Gazette? Yes, sir, and I was put through with two illustrious gentlemen, uh, by Colonel Lowry, the sage of, uh, of newspaper men in those days, and and uh, Jim Greer. Jim Greer. I knew them both. Do you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jim, Jim Greer came through Nelson in 1904 to uh, go up and found a paper in Poplar Creek at the time of the rush, the Poplar Creek Nugget. And Colonel Lowry at that time had his printing plant where uh, Thompson's funeral home is. And he used to print the ledge on the Tribune Press. So I got to know the Colonel very, very well. Oh, by the way, the Thompson Funeral Home was my own home, too. I built, I bought that, then sold it to the Thompson Funeral Home. Yes. Well, that uh, building was originally built, I believe, by Billy Burroughs. No, by the Kellogg family. It was enlarged by Billy Burroughs. He used to work for D.J. Robertson. That's right. And uh, after Burroughs went back east, then it was taken over by uh, the ledge, by Colonel Lowry. After about uh, two years here, he moved it to Greenwood, where he was still publishing the paper at the time of his death. That's my, there's no reason, no doubt the reason why I bought that. I must have smelt printer's ink then when that I got in exactly, there. That would be it exactly, that would be it exactly. Well, uh, at one time you told me that you were the oldest registered printer in the interior, and I differed with you. Well, I, I don't think that you can differ with me at all now, because I think I'm o the only uh, active printer today from that, that uh, in 50 years. Uh, oh, yes, I'll, the, I'll grant you that, in, but in uh, the, at the time Wyman Hill left Nelson, uh, went to Calgary, uh, uh, Colonel Lowry gave him a great write-up in the ledge in Greenwood. Uh -huh. And uh, give him quite a history of Wyman. And he said at the time that left himself and Rube McCandlish and Nelson as the two oldest registered printers in the interior of British Columbia. Well, I, I forgot. I was articled as an apprentice in 1904, May the 6th, to John Houston. Well, I forgot you ever worked in the printed business. Uh, I put in three you, years. Don't you forget I worked for the printer old John Houston, too. <laughs> yes, I can vouch for Ross on that. Well, I guess we're getting <laughs> kind of a mix-up here. The first thing but, you know, uh, we'll have a quorum. I was, I was, uh, I was uh, regularly entered as an apprentice. Wow. Well, and well, if I, you can hunt the hunt up the records of old 545, you'll still see my name on the books. Uh, going back to printing, though, I I learned this I learned the printing trade in the in the old country. I worked for at the Folkestone Herald, mm -hmm. and that's where I started out picking type. And uh, my first experience there. Well, in the early days here, as you know, all the printers were boomers, tramps, as they used to say. 
No. And it is surprising at that time the number of old country journeymen we had. Send him around if I see him. There were several worked through here at different times while I was working for the Tribune and the Daily News. And they were all excellent craftsmen. I think the two most outstanding, the two of them, was our friend Pac McSwain. I worked with Pac McSwain. And a fellow named uh, Knight. Uh, Red Knight. Red yes, Knight. I knew Red two Knight. outstanding. Uh, well, you have forgotten the two famous Joneses. Wow. Old wow. style Bill Jones and Priority Bill yeah, Jones. Yeah, but they, uh, <laughs> that, that was, uh, used to call him uh, Nompel Jones. Yeah, well, the, I'm speaking time. the Welshman. That was uh, Priority Bill. And the big fellow, old style, he was an American. He was a very prominent man in uh, typographical union affairs, although he was a boomer printer. But I doubt if there was a convention in a period of 25 or 30 years where Jones wasn't carrying the proxy for a half a dozen unions. And there was another one in Nelson, too. He used to do a lot of traveling. Charlie Dake. Oh, I worked with Dake. Charlie, Charlie taught me more in, uh, in a month than I could have learned of any printer school. He was a real printer. They came to Nelson with John Houston. And matter of fact, Dake and uh, Houston worked together at Donald before they came here. First thing you know, we'll have a story. Yeah, yeah C.D. Dake. Uh, Dake, by the way, is buried alongside my father, John Houston, in the Nelson Cemetery. Oh, yeah. Oh, Charlie, I remember him quite well. Very big and fellow, six foot. By the way, Charlie Dake was one of the first tuba players in Nelson. I knew you Charlie used to play tuba in the old band here. Uh, Al Gillis had a picture taken in uh, 93 or 94. And Dake was playing tuba in that band. I came here three weeks ago. That's going way back when. Unless One of my big regrets is that we never got. Uh, is this still going on? Yeah, we never got Dake ribbed up, or uh, Tregillis ribbed up, to put the names of those men on that picture. And there's nobody else on the face of the earth now knows who they were, except uh, possibly yourself and me that could pick out two or three of them. The rest are all gone. Uh huh. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Pearson, for recording your voice for us. Well, I like to tell you, I've been you with this uh, now, famous Nelson Daily News me. now for, uh, I'm in my 28th year with them. Sure. Well, the last I time I worked for the Nelson Daily News was in uh, 1910. I was oh, mailing so there for them. Oh, well, that Under was, Garland uh, Foster. That's, that's quite a few years before I got this yeah. story. Yes, so I, I used to work for the Nelson Daily News every time I got a holiday. <laughs> I suspended in Nelson working for the Nelson Daily News, getting experience. Thanks, well, thank, thanks, Charlie. Thanks very much. Hey. Now, wait a minute. And the next, ladies and gentlemen, our uh, genial secretary and the historian of the Old Timers Association, R.G. Joy, has consented to tell us a story to preserve on tape for future generations. Go ahead, Mr. Joy. This was in the year 1894. I was walking up the road near the Dudeney Trail to Roslyn and I met an old gentleman I thought was a Yankee. I found out later that he was a man from the Isle of Man and I asked him what he was going to do. He said, I'm going to build a bakery. I said, have you any money? No, he says, I have no money. What are you going to do for capital? He pulled out his gold watch. He says, that's my bank. He says, I'll get enough lumber and stuff to put up a little oven and start business. He did so. Make a long story short, I bought him out. The oven was rock and brick on the side of Spokane Creek. And the oven door was a cola can bashed with the end out both ends out, and the damper was a coal oil can, and the peel, or shovel as you call it, was made from lumber from the bush. Well, I carried on there for a while, and they used to call me the kid, and I used to play the violin in the bake shop of the night, and I'd have four or five prospectors for an audience. And one of them was an Irishman, he was very fond of the Kalani song, 
and there was a Swede with a good baritone voice and they used to get him to sing solos. Well, time went on and the men said to me, say kid, how you doing? Just then there was four or five bakeries in town and each one trying to put each other out of business. I said my old oven's falling down and if I had twenty dollars I could build a, a new one. Dutch Jake would do the carpentering, Joe Winchester would do the brickwork, Harry Ashcroft would make the door, so on and so forth. I went to bed that night, I used to sleep up on the rafters. My counter was two barrels and two one by ten boards. My uh, light in the window was two by six, piece of two by six, four nails, inside of which was a candle, the same in the bake shop. I started to sweep out the store with my broom and I found two twenty-dollar bills on the floor. I opened the door and there was a man that was in my bakery in the previous evening and I said, you fellas lose any money? He says, no. He says, you're damn fool. He says, didn't you say you wanted twenty dollars? That's how the old timers had a way of helping one another. No fuss, no nothing just left me the twenty dollars on the floor and I built the new oven and eventually sold the whole outfit for three hundred dollars and in six weeks time I was in Nelson nearly dead with typhoid fever I will tell you how I got transported from Rosslyn to Robson and Robson to, to Nelson and uh, how I succeeded in getting a place to be nursed. That's enough, see? Thank you, George. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as an added attraction, we have uh, persuaded Bob Main. He needs no introduction to you. He's well known throughout the Kootenays. He has a, I may say, an international reputation as an author. And every now and again, Bob bursts forth into poetry. Any of you who read on the editorial page of today's Daily News will find a nice little poem by Mr. Maine dedicated to the Kootenays. Now, Mr. Maine has kindly consented to read that for you and, uh, I believe, tell you a story. All right, take it away, Mr. Maine. From a shack on the shores of the Kootenay sprang a city of charm and beauty. The magic wands of the pioneers guided them in their loyal duty. And now the city of Nelson stands, the reward of careful planning. Brain, brawn and muscle all combined, the sweat from their faces fanning. Today in this lovely lakeside park, the pioneers all will gather to talk with pleasure of work well done, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, telling the tales of the glorious past when they were young and carefree, perhaps building a shack by the side of a creek or swinging an axe into some tree, sailing away up the mountainside, wealth under their feet maybe, or resting by a splashing creek and brewing a cup of tea. Those were the days they will never forget of the pals they met on the way with a happy smile or a helping hand to cheer them on many a day. Oh, happy day, let joy prevail. Nelson thanks and blesses you. May the years to come see you live again, Canadians both loyal and true. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you a story. You will remember 
the days before the first war, there were quite many Englishmen came here, some of them remittance men. But uh, they, most of them joined the army thinking it would be a nice holiday and it would be all over in six months' time. Well, one of those, <coughs> one day, an Englishman blew into uh, Nelson and he went down to George Ferguson's Nelson Transfer and he said to George Ferguson, uh, I want a bucking bronco. George said, you mean a saddle horse? Oh no, no I ride any damn thing in your stable. It's just bring me out a bucking bronco. So George said to his man, he says, do you think you could get the saddle on that kitlish mare? And the man went into the stable and after a bit of rattling he got the saddle on and he uh, led the mare out and the Englishman he said, ah, oh, ah, oh, he says, uh, give me a leg up. So he gave him a leg up and retreated pretty quickly. In about a minute, the Englishman was picking himself up off Vernon Street and brushing his legs with his gloves. He says, what did she do? George said, why, she bucked you. Oh, bucked me, did she? Damn good job I got off before she started the Bronco. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bain. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to give you an idea of what the shooting's all about and recording voices, they, these tape records are going to be kept in the archives of the Old Timers Association, and we're trying to record the voices of all the old timers that we can get our hands on for posterity. Now, at the present time, I'm going to record the voice of uh, Mr. Gene Levesque. He doesn't need any introduction. Anybody that knows him wish they didn't, and so on. But he's very well known around the town. Come on in, Gene. Where were you born, Levesque? Born in Winnipeg. A couple of days ago. Uh, well, now, I'm not going to ask the date. I don't want to embarrass you. I know you're posing as a kid around here. When did you come to British Columbia? Came to British Columbia in 1904. Into Revelstoke. Into Revelstoke. Yeah. How long were you there? Oh, we were in Revelstoke for quite a while. I didn't come to Nelson until 1912. Come down and uh, with a bunch of Boy Scouts, and we parked in the park down here for a week, and and uh, had a pretty good time, I think, for a bunch of kids. Well, they generally manage to have a good time wherever they are, at whatever age. Uh, how long have you been in the CPR? Well, CPR putting in 40 years now. Well, now, first thing you know, you'll be giving away your age. <laughs> However, you uh, are in hopes of finishing out your railroad career in Nelson, are you not? Oh, yes, I hope I finish it out in Nelson. And I'm well, hoping to stay here. Well, we hope you will, Gene, because you're a nice handy guy to have around at almost uh, yeah, any time. Yeah, I know, I know. Now, I would a, suggest... That uh, you go ahead and tell the folks a story. This, I may add, ladies and gentlemen, is not required of all those who register their voices, but uh, Gene has a particular talent for telling stories, so go ahead and take it away, Gene. Well, I don't know. This business of telling stories is all very well for some of these fellows that came around here in 1896. They can tell us all kinds of things, and we can't contradict them. But uh, I feel like a Johnny come lately to some of these fellows. But I did know some of the old timers, and I remember a, a story that old, about old Joe Deshawn there that used to be up in Rosin and had the uh, uh, had a lumber camp down around Birchbank. And one day there was one of the fellows happened to fall into the river there at the camp, and he was drowned. And Joe, coming down the trail a little while later. 
that he met some fellows going up and they said to him, say, Joe, there's one of the fellows fell off the boom down there and he got drowned. No, Joe says, yeah, I drowned very bad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another time there was a fellow there working in Joe's camp and a tree fell on him one night. And they, uh, they did everything they could, but the poor fellow died the next morning. They were put him on a sleigh and they were bringing him down to the railroad station at Birch Bank. And uh, a couple of these fellows that were there, there were a couple of French Canadians that were working for Joe. And they met a fellow going up hunting and he says, what's that you got in the sleigh? He says, is that a corpse? He says, no, no, that's a Frenchman got killed last night, died this morning. He says, well, there, there used to be a couple of, all kinds of these fellows around the country that were pretty, uh, well, they were, they had a sense of humor all their own. And some of these, uh, some of these remittance men that uh, Mr. Maine was telling you about. I used to know quite a few of these fellas, and uh, some of them were pretty good heads. One fella I knew took a trip back to England and he shocked all his folks over there by going out and hobnobbing with the gardener and all that sort of thing, and you weren't supposed to do that in the old country in those days. But uh, he used to have a great time doing that. He, his folks gave him about $25,000 and he started back for the Arrow Lakes. Three months later, he got back to the Arrow Lakes and he was broke. But he'd had a whale of a time on the way home. <laughs> now, I haven't got any more to say around here, but I'm very glad to be here this year and I'm hoping I'll be back here next year and we'll see all the same old timers back at the picnic. You were, you were related to Pete Lebeck of Rossland, weren't you? No, no relation. No, relation. no, I knew Pete when he was, when I was just a kid, but I was no relation. Well, thanks very much. Uh Hello, folks. Uh, this is Ross Fleming speaking. I have in my studio today Chester A. Hayward, universally known as Cap. Uh, and uh, he was in Nelson previous to 1900 and uh, was a, an old school chum of mine. I used to go up uh, fishing with him up to Five Mile Point when his father uh, ran the International. Uh, when the, the steamer went up there uh, d during their loading time uh, on their CPR, or at least the uh, Great Northern Route. Uh, where were you born, uh, Mr. Hayward? I was born in Brownsville, Oregon in 1887. And your, uh, your folks came from where? Uh, they came out in a covered wagon from Missouri along in the 50s, 1850s. Mm -hmm. And uh, after your father was out in this uh, territory, he, uh, he became a captain, did he? Well, uh, when he got to uh, uh, Kootenai, of course, he was down in Portland, Oregon, and worked his way across from Maine to Oregon in his young days. And uh, he was in Portland, Oregon for a while, and he came up into the Kootenais. Uh, when did he come up into the Kootenais? Well, he uh, got here with the old Tug Galena that in uh, 1885, the latter part of 1885. Mm. Now, this, uh, this Galena had quite a, a career, didn't it? It, uh, it was brought in by, uh, by uh, train. Uh, do you know where it was built? Well, I do not know where it was built, but it came in by train as far as the end of the line at that time, which was still east of Bonner's Ferry. It that's hadn't a, been hooked up there yet. That's the Great Northern. That's the Great Northern. And then, uh, in order to get to Bonner's Ferry, uh, that is on the Kootenai River, isn't it? Uh, in order to get to uh, Bonner's Ferry, it had to be uh, skidded? Yes, he skidded in. He had the... Uh, the tug on the skids, and he had a donkey engine that would go ahead and then pull the tug along, the skids along, until he found a place uh, in the vicinity of Browner's Ferry where he could get it into the Kootenai River. Mm -hmm. And then uh, then he brought it up the, uh, well, it would be down the Kootenai River, wouldn't it, from Browner's Ferry, uh, into the Kootenai Lake. That's right, to, uh, to uh, Pilot Bay. And then it was, it was uh, more or less stationed at, uh, at Pilot Bay. That was headquarters for it, uh, kind of being owned by the Galena Trading Company. It owned the Galena mine there at uh, Pilot Bay in those days. Oh, yes. I think it's still operating to some extent. 
uh, I don't think uh, the, there's much uh, doing uh, as far as the mind is concerned. Uh -huh. But, um, uh, Doctor, uh, unless, did you find on your uh, visit up the lake here f a couple of days ago uh, that there was any work being done at the G Galena mine? No, I did not, because I didn't get to uh, get right over there where I could take a good look at yes. it. Yes, uh, of course, you never know when prospectors would pick up some of these uh, old places and, and work them, so I was just wondering. No, when you talk about mining, you never know what's ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, now, uh, the manager of this mine uh, uh, was rather uh, an all-around man, wasn't he? Uh, well, he was Dr. J.W. Hendricks, uh, and he was the, uh, in charge, the chief of the mining operation and the Galena Trading uh, Company there at the time. And he was also a medical doctor, was he? Yes, he was a physician surgeon. And uh, he uh, even officiated at uh, the uh, birth of one of your sisters. That's right. He's, a, he's the one we blame for it <laughs> in <laughs> that 1892. Is, <laughs> that is Daphne. <laughs> and she lives uh, now at uh, Santa Rosa, California. Is that right? That's right, with her daughter and grandchildren. Ah, yes. Well, now uh, you also have, an, have another sister who uh, has claim on this part of the world. Uh, that's right. She was born in Nelson in uh, 1897, and she lives in Portland along with her daughter and grandchildren. That's uh, Helen Maud. That's right. And uh, Dr. Lobo, a well-known uh, former doctor of Nelson, was uh, her physician. Is yes, that right? he, he officiated. And he, he was my uncle, by the way, too. He uh, married my mother's younger sister here in Nelson. Oh, that's quite interesting. Now... Uh, your, your dad uh, worked for the uh, Galena Trading Company until the Alexandra Company put in their first steamer. Uh, was, was there a headquarters in Caslow? Caslow was the headquarters, and uh, that was for the stern wheelers. For the stern wheelers. They, first they the were good-sized good size boats. Yes. But the bo boat that your, uh, your father was best uh, known uh, to have uh, commanded was the Steamer International. Is yes, that, right? that, that was the last one, and I think that was in service from, uh, oh, 1896, 7, until, uh, well, until 1900, practically, or 99, until they put in the Moye. Yes, I see. Well, uh, the, we all remember the, uh, the, the Steamer International and the Steamer uh, Kokanee, who used to be uh, great competitors on the lake, running from here to Caslow. And at, at, in many instances, there are times where uh, very similar, and they used to have quite a number of races. Well, See, they had a race every time they uh, opportunity afforded, but the one big race was uh, just uh, uh, upriver from Nelson here, between here and Five Mile Point. And mm -hmm. the picture that I gave the museum will show that very clearly. Yes. Well, that's fine. Now, they... Um, It'd be interesting to know just how the ore was handled from uh, Pilot Bay in the early days. Uh, you, you tell me that the uh, Galena barged the ore to Bonas Ferry? Yes, after the Galena got in here and got operating, there were more tugs came in eventually, and of course an awful lot of stern wheelers eventually, but uh, in those uh, early days, they had to, uh, tug had to barge the ore. There was no room on tugboats uh, to load ore. Mm -hmm. Then later on, of course, the stern wheelers, they held the sack door mm -hmm. either to uh, Bonners Ferry or here at uh, Five Mile Point, Troop Junction, mm -hmm. onto the GN for the uh, Butte smelters. There were no smelters in the early days in this country at all, Slocan mm -hmm. or Rosslyn or What Portland. were the uh, smelters that they used to go? Uh, it seems to me I remember the early days. There's the names Anaconda and Boise. Well, those were mines. Those were mines, oh, names were of mines. mines. Oh, I see. But the, uh, the smelter, the smelter didn't have any name except uh, by city. But uh, in those early days, uh, it was only a butte. But later on, there were plenty of smelters around Montana and other places, the same as here in the Kootenai District, oh, the yeah. Sokan District. Uh -huh. uh, yes, well, they, they uh, as you say, uh, later, uh, the Great Northern, after the Great Northern was built into here, the ore was uh, transferred at the Five Mile Point. And that's where we had our good times fishing, wasn't it? I'll say we did. <laughs> uh, they, they, the boat would come in from Caslow in the morning, 
uh, in the early morning and then uh, it would leave as soon as it had discharged its uh, Nelson freight and, and passengers. It used to go back to Five Mile Point to um, transfer the ore into the um, Great Northern cars. And uh, so we would go back with a boat and do our fishing during the middle of the day. And then later, the boat would come back to Nelson to take the regular run. I think it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, wasn't it, that they started back to About 3.30. Three, about 3.30. Three about three mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, that, uh, those are interesting times, and uh, it provided us with uh, some fishing. Sometimes we fished off the boat, and sometimes we fished off the, the uh, boxcars. Yes. The boxcars ran down in a... We had pretty good meals on the boat, too. Yes. <laughs> uh, the, 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 um, the cars used to run right down into the water. The Y uh, for the Great Northern ran right down into the water. <coughs> and uh, sometimes the, uh, the water was putting her up to the, the deck of the, of the cars. Yep, well, I now, remember that. Uh, you have been uh, visiting quite a few uh, places uh, on this trip. Uh, I understand uh, Herb Harp. Um, uh, made a, a great contribution to your visit this time in taking you around uh, Pilot Bay and uh, Randall and where else did he go? That's right, he certainly did over in there and of course we enjoyed the, the uh, ferry ride across the river, especially the part in the um, wheelhouse talking with the officers. Oh, yes. <laughs> Uh-huh. And uh, where all did you go on this uh, trip with her? Uh, well, to her? tell the truth, I just don't know. Of course, I'm what yeah, you might call a stranger, and I was kind of lost. I don't know. But, <laughs> but uh, you went up to... Uh, around that vicinity, uh, he anyway. He took you up to Randall, did he? Yes. Well, uh, that was uh, really out of his way, uh, because he lives at Crawford Bay, doesn't he? Then I, he, he took you back to Crawford Bay and Pilot so. Bay. I believe so, yeah. Yes. Well, that was very nice of him. Uh, and who else have you seen <coughs> on this trip here? Well, on Monday I was down to uh, visit uh, Mrs. Fletcher at Ainsworth and showed her uh, some things that actually happened right there at Ainsworth in 1891, which they were glad to see, and had a wonderful visit, and they took me on down and showed me Castle, which I hadn't seen since 1895. Mm -hmm. So I just had a wonderful time. Well, here. now tell me about these uh, things that you brought up this time that uh, you hadn't but with you before, that you showed Mrs. Uh, Fletcher up at Ainsworth. Uh, you have a testimonial to your, to your father? Well, uh, I had a copy of the 1891 Nelson Miner, uh, which had a little item covering what happened at Angeworth about six days before when the citizens of Angeworth and the Her Majesty's Commissioner and the, some JPs and, and among other things about 20 ladies there they presented the Captain with a gold watch mm -hmm. and uh, I, it, I still have the original scroll yes you showed me that, the scroll that, that uh, very nice yes don't seem much like that anymore. No, and those were the days when um, uh, they were just beginning to really organize the uh, captains in this uh, district. And uh, uh, your, your dad had to get some other testimonials from people. Uh, that pointed up uh, the fact that in the early days, uh, most of the travel came up the Kootenai or came down the Kootenai That's right. uh, from uh, uh, Bonnes Ferry and uh, Reichertz was the name of a, an officer in the early days, her a customs officer. He was Her Majesty's uh, custom official. Yes, and he was, uh, he was a pretty big, uh, oh, pretty yes. big shot in those oh, days, yes. wasn't he? He was, he was a big official. And uh, he was uh, practically the only uh, one uh, in this district at that time. Uh, yes, the only one, only customs. Uh, yes. And, and he that was on a par with what they called a uh, gold commissioner uh, yes. as far as mining. Oh, yes. See, yes. He was see. commissioner of customer, yes. customs. And yes. Well, that's, uh, that's very interesting, too, because uh, that's, uh, that shows uh, uh, the, uh, the beginnings of uh, our present uh, uh, life. Uh, in the Kootenays, because yes. it, uh, it shows that there is only uh, w practically one avenue at that time. And uh, that, into the uh, that Kalina really started the mining boom here in the Kootenays in the Slocan district. Mm -hmm. 
Because they just flocked in from then on. Yes. Well, now, uh, uh, well, now it's been uh, very nice having this interview with you, Cap. <coughs> and uh, we certainly uh, hope you have a uh, safe visit ho uh, back, uh, a safe uh, return back to your home in Portland. <coughs> You've been there since <coughs> 1902, is it? That's right. And uh, and uh, you have been working for um, the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle Railway? You yes, start? ever yeah, since, yeah. Uh, well, uh, started in 1910, all three years during the war, and then back in service again. Mm -hmm. so it started, it started so. in with the Oregon Trunk uh, Railway Construction yes, which, well, uh, Department, which is the same Which is the same company. as the SBNS. And you have now been superannuated from the Maintenance of Way Department with 47 years of service. That's right. Uh, that's, that's a lifetime. That's very nice. <laughs> and uh, you still propose to uh, keep uh, this district in your mind and coming up here every year for a Absolutely. Visit. I'm going to try to get up here next uh, September, towards the end of September if I can. If uh, not, then I'll certainly come up maybe in uh, April or May. Mm -hmm. And that's if the good Lord is willing, I'm going to do that. Well, that's fine. And in the meantime, uh, there aren't words to express my thanks to all the people that have that I visited and talked with and that have helped me out with information and that includes you Ross. <laughs> <laughs> well that's fine. In fact you're number one. <laughs> <laughs> well I, I, uh, I'm I awfully glad that uh, that uh, we got on the track of Herb Harp because that has meant a lot. Yes he helped a lot and he helped me a lot down at Ainsworth. And then you've uh, visited some of the others, uh, the Kinahan girls and oh uh, yes and, and uh, believe me that was an enjoyable visit i'll never forget that visit with them well that's fine and uh, you've you've seen quite a few other people and uh we certainly wish you all the uh, best health in the world and we hope to see you up here often well thank you that's my wish and hope too <laughs> thank you very much ross The foregoing was an interview with Chester A. Hayward of Portland, Oregon, familiarly known as Cap or Chet. The dateline is Nelson, June the 29th, 1960.